Good morning. Man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have your Bible or your phone or your iPad, John chapter 8 is where we will be. We're in week three of this series on uh, the I Am statements. All we're doing, all we're doing is walking through the Gospel of John. Uh, the, the idea, the, the goal behind all of this, behind, behind this whole series, is understanding that if we turn our eyes to Jesus, if we look at Jesus and consider Jesus, not just what He's done for us, but, but actually who He is, if we look at who Jesus is, the Bible says that that has a transforming effect on us as people, that, that our lives are transformed Not just by knowing what Jesus has done, but really by gazing at who Jesus is and understanding who he is. And so today uh, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 12 and we're going to look at Jesus as the light of the world. Verse 12 says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself your testimony is not true. Now, things get awkward in that situation. We'll go over that in a second. Verse 14. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Now, if you're reading the Bible with imagination, which I encourage you to do, try and put yourself in that situation. This is a really awkward moment. Jesus is sitting here in the temple, and he's teaching, and there's a crowd there, just like there is now. In his teaching, he says, I am the light of the world. And someone speaks up, someone speaks up in the crowd, and someone says, you're trying to testify to yourself, uh, and you're a liar. I mean, that's awkward, is it not? That's an awkward situation. No, he did not say that to Jesus. That was my attitude, sorry. Sorry. Jesus says, what if I am testifying about myself? I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. You don't know where I come from. You don't know where I'm going. Uh, So how would you know if I'm lying or not? Something is going on here. Why are they so offended by this statement? Like I might say some things up here, and I will eventually say some things up here uh, that might quasi offend you. There, there's a possibility I say something up here today that's going to quasi offend you. And you're like, I, I can't believe he believes in that, right? Like, what an idiot. Uh, and, and you just kind of walk out of here going, man, that guy's a moron. But, but, and, and I can live with that because I will say some idiotic things from time to time. But, but it, it would be a special kind of offense, right, for you to stand up right now and, and call me a ridiculous liar. Like, that, that would, you would have to be significantly offended for that. Yet in the middle of this teaching, this guy says, you're testifying about yourself and what you say is not true. So, so what's really happening is this kind of <clears throat> weird dialogue. And, and then Jesus' Jesus's response is, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, but, but you don't know either. So this idea of light and the imagery of light for a Hebrew in the first century, particularly an expert of the law, would have had massive connotations. And so maybe the best way to unpack what Jesus is saying is just to kind of think briefly about Genesis 1. So here's what happens in Genesis 1. The Bible says the state of the universe looks like this. It's formless. It's dark. It's void. Then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters, and God says, let there be light. And from that moment, light came out of the mouth of God at 186,000 miles per hour. From that sentence, structure began to replace formlessness. What was formless was being formed, and darkness was put on its heels, and what was void began to be filled with life. This process of what is formless being formed when darkness is being put on its heels and what is void being filled with life is the way God begins to interact with his creation, particularly men and women moving forward. And so when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, Jesus is making some claims 
that are unacceptable for those that are moral elites, for those that have built their worth on their ability to check boxes, the people who feel that because of their behavior, they are better than somebody else. This is a massive threat to to their existence because Jesus just said, I am God. That's what he said in that statement. So when he says, you can make, you can say that my testimony is false, uh, but I know where I come from. What's he talking about? He was there, right? He is the Word made flesh. So when God says, let there be light, who's the active force in creation? Jesus. Jesus is like, I know where I came from. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. Where's that? Revelation 22. And on that day, there will no longer be a need for the sun or the moon, for the glory of God will be the light. There's a day coming in the new heavens and the new earth where there's no sun, There's no moon because you don't need that because seeing Christ face to face will illuminate in a way that's better than the way the sun illuminates now. So, so, so we won't need anything to reflect the light because the light will be in our midst. This is Jesus's rebuttal to you're a liar. He says, I alone take what is formless and I form it. I alone put darkness on its heels. I alone fill the void with life. That's my outline. So number one, he takes what's formless to form. In the Westminster Catechism, which is basically a tool that the church has used for a long time to intellectually shape our understanding of God, the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is a great question, a question that everyone is trying to answer. And here's the question, what is the chief end of man? If I can put it in words that we more common language, the question is, why are we here? Why do we exist? What is all this about? Now, the catechism gives the answer. And here's the answer the Westminster Shorter Catechism gives. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So the purpose of your life, the purpose of my life, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How amazing is that purpose? Like, like what is your ultimate purpose? To enjoy God? Right? Right? Well, how are you going to do that? By glorifying Him? Well, how do you do that? By rightly living and ordering my life around His commands that are all meant to lead to the fullest life possible. So we're, we are Christians. We're not, we're not crusty uh, prudes. You are a whole person. There, there's a real mysterious kind of thing, whether it's uh, psychology or, or uh, philosophy or theology. There, there, there's this argument about this, but here's what we almost can always all agree upon. You have at the center of who you are, a soul. The soul is eternal. And yet attached to that soul are these really massive things like your intellect. Your intellect doesn't stand alone. It's attached to your soul. Your physical body isn't on its own. It's attached to your soul, which is why you can wound the body and it affects the soul because you have emotions. You feel things, whether you want to call it the heart or whatever. So when we say that the chief end of man, the reason we exist, the the reason we're physical and intellectual, the reason that we have heart, and the reason the the Spirit kind of pulls those things in like a tractor beam is that our chief end is realized by us being a holistic people. This is how we work. It's why stress manifests itself in physical ways. It's why anxiety creates a physical effect. Anxiety is a feeling built around what you believe to be true, worked out in a physical form. So when we're talking about Jesus being the light of the world, we're saying that outside of Jesus Christ, outside of a relationship with Jesus, we, we, we are way outside of how we were designed to be, how we were designed to function. Therefore, we're not fulfilling what we were created to fulfill. And therefore, in a very real sense, we're unmade, we're unformed. Yet when we come to Christ, the light of the world, he begins to form us. So outside of Christ, we're formless, but as we enter into a relationship with him, he begins to form us. If you have a church background, which I'm sure many of us do, the language Christians use for this is called sanctification. We are being formed. We are being sanctified. Now, just for a quick moment of honesty, if you're a believer here, how many Christians would be like, I I hate the pace of this formation thing, right? I hate the pace that for how long this takes. It seems to be moving a little slow. 
So, so let me try to encourage you real quick. When we're talking about spiritual birth, it, it's helpful to think about physical birth. You didn't come out of the womb ready to do push-ups, right? You came out of the womb 99% cartilage with a self-destruct button on the top of your head that if you push that thing, bad things were going to happen. You, you were mainly cartilage, and over a period of time, you begin uh, to be able to feed yourself, right? You, be, you began to be able to crawl. You began to be able to walk. You began to be able to run. Now, it's slower, and yet this is how the Lord grows us. It's slower than we like, but we are being formed. If you are a Christian, in your highs and in your lows, you are being formed. So we can despise how long it takes but just be glad in knowing that you are being informed, that it is a process. Number two, he takes us from darkness to light. The Bible is going to say outside of a relationship of Jesus Christ, we are in what's called in the scriptures in the domain of darkness. All right? So when we become Christians, Colossians says we're transformed out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's in this moment that we're moved from darkness and into the light. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't submitted to him, if you're not in relationship, the Bible is going to say that you're walking in a kind of spiritual blindness, that, that you, just can't, you simply just can't see what's ultimate reality. You can see some things, but not what's ultimate. You can feel some things, but not what's ultimate. That This is called the domain of darkness. It, it, it's trying to navigate life without really knowing what is the ultimate reality. You can run and run and run, but, but you really don't know if you're heading in the right direction. When, when you're walking in darkness, even when you think you know where things are, you don't necessarily know where things are. How many of us have walked through our house in the, in the darkness, because we don't want to wake anybody up, and we find that bedpost, we find that table. We've walked past those things thousands of times, have we not? But somehow in the darkness, our little toe reminds us, nope, that's where that thing is, right? And, 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 and then that, that challenges our testimony before the Lord, right? Like this, th that's what it's like to be spiritually outside of Christ. We're walking, we think we know what we're doing, but we're walking in darkness. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's talking about illumination. The Bible tells us that when the Holy Spirit awakens our hearts to the reality of Jesus Christ, this integration piece that we're starting, uh, that we're starting talking about earlier, it actually starts to happen. The scriptures are open to us and we can understand them in a way we couldn't understand before we were Christians. We read now with our minds informed by truth. Our hearts, they begin to take shape. And that fuels us, fuels some of our emotions. So we're now free to worship. Not coldly, not intellectually only, but, but really we're stirred in our affections for the God of the Bible because he has done these things. Because our mind believes and has informed the heart. And that's how it's fueled our response to what God has done in us. That's where worship is created. This is the work of light. Now, I want to take advantage of this darkness to light thing to have a conversation about some of the aspects that are scary about God, right? They're awesome, but scary. I want you to think for just a second. I want you to think for just a second. It should create a little bit of nervousness in you. Nothing is hidden from God. That should make you a little nervous. You have no secrets, none. Now, here's a fun exercise I like to play with myself. Uh, if you're ever feeling cocky spiritually, no, no one is ever going to admit that they feel that, but there's times we feel that. Uh, but if you've ever been in a place in your spiritual walk where you're like, you know, people should really watch how I do things, their life would be a lot better. If you've ever been there, if you've ever been there, you find yourself saying that, that, that a lot, I want you to play this game. Here's a fun game to play. Would you still... Be confident in that swagger if we took all the thoughts that you had this week, all the thoughts you had this week, and we put them on the screens behind me, and we let that play as a movie for the rest of us. If we took all your thoughts, all your doubts, all your lusts, all the things you wanted to say but didn't, and we just watched them, are you going to stay and watch your own movie? First of all, I don't think you would stay. And secondly, if you did, 
That, that swagger would fade in a hurry. There's nothing hidden from God, ever. You have no secrets, not in your mind, not in your heart, not in your activities. So, so that feeling that we get sometimes that we're getting away with something, I'm trying to love you enough to say you're not getting away with anything. David says it like this in Psalm 139. He says, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So, so if you have this idea that you can wait to two in the morning and, and dress like a ninja and God is not going to be able to see what you're doing, you're deceived. There, there's no place to hide. You cannot camouflage yourself from God. Even being here today is ineffective camouflage. You can't hide. If you're a hunter, there, there's nothing you can spray on you. There, there's nothing you can wear. There's no position that you can get into that you can't hide from God. You have no secrets because it's a myth. Secrets are the darkness in which death and destruction grow. If you're not a Christian, my expectation is that you're walking in what the Bible would call your flesh. You're outside of Christ. You're just doing what seems right to you. But, but if I could take a moment just to speak to those of us that are Christians, specifically, there's this really heinous lie that Christians believe that, that, that because we're Christians, because we follow Jesus, we should be past a certain point and we shouldn't struggle with some of the things that we struggle with. When, when you believe that, you, you're drawn into secrecy. You're, you're drawn into hiding and you let the hooks of death and destruction grow into you. Now, I'm telling you, this is 16 years of pastoral ministry, and I'm pleading with you right now. So, so let me give you a couple of real life examples. Now, obviously, I haven't been here long enough, so none of these are anybody in this room, but these are real life examples. You're a housewife, and you've gotten yourself addicted to prescription pills, and you feel guilty and ashamed. You feel controlled. You keep swearing, you, you, you keep saying you're not going to do it, you're going to stop, but you keep falling back into it, and you can't tell anybody. What's your husband going to think? What are the people in your small group going to think? What, what, what about the ladies that you do yoga with? They know you're a Christian, they know you're a religious type, what are they going to do when they find this out about you? So what you do is you say, that's, that's too risky. I can't share that with anybody. So you retreat into the shadows. You don't take the off-ramp of confession. You hide. And darkness becomes the place that those hooks of death and destruction, and they set deeper. Or you're a man, and you're flirting with some girl at work. Or you're a woman at home just perusing Facebook. When you come across that ex-boyfriend... And you just begin to remember all the fun things and good things that he did for you. Now, you forget about the seven times he cheated on you, but you remember the good things. And what happens is you begin to romanticize the past. And your mind space and your gladness is no longer towards your husband, but it's towards this other man. Now, you can feel a tinge of shame. You can feel a tinge of this is wrong. Then instead of taking the off-ramp of confession, we retreat into the darkness. And as we retreat into the darkness, the hooks sink deeper. There's this fear of, if I confess this, I could lose my marriage. If I confess this, I could lose my job. If I confess this, people are going to look funny at me. And it forces us, those thoughts, they force us into the darkness. And by going into the darkness, that's where the hooks of death and destruction begin to set. And, and here's what happens. Here's why it's so heartbreaking. Because then it costs you your marriage. And then it costs you your job. And then in the mercy of God, when you get outed, people look at you a strange way. So King David, writing about this, now, King David is an expert on this as a murdering adulterer. This is what he says in Psalm 32. He says, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, we can believe that, right? Like, we can get behind that. Nobody wants to argue that. Happy, glad, joyful is the man who understands that they've been forgiven. Like, that's a great feeling, how joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin and whose spirit is no deceit. Now, deceit in this verse is not, does not mean he's not guilty of anything, but rather he has nothing to hide. He's not hiding anything. Watch what happens here. Now, this is where science thinks it's discovered something 
that the Bible has uh, been teaching since it was written in verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my, my sin. David is saying in this text, in Psalms, when I'm in the dark, when I'm living a duplicitous life, when I have chosen not the embarrassment of confession, but the self-determined willpower to overcome in the darkness, projecting an ideal self, uh, projecting an ideal image, a, a better version of myself than what is truly reality, and, and I'm bearing the weight of that, uh, I, I'm not just going to take the easy way out. Th- th- this is a conversation I have with my children all the time. Th- this is an issue I, I can't tell you how often I've sat down with my children and I said, okay, right, this is a really big moment for you. This is a really big moment for you. I'm asking you this, and, and here's what you get to do. You're going to get to choose to be honest with me. And then you're going to learn that your mom's love and my love is not predicated upon your behavior. Now, if you're like, do you really use the word predicated? Uh, no, he, the youngest one's six. I don't, we don't do that. But uh, I'll say, or you can either choose to be, or you can choose to lie to me. And if you lie to me, buddy, if you lie to me, listen, I'm trying to, ple- if you lie to me, you're choosing not just to bear the weight of one life, but to bear the weight of two. And and nobody has been designed to bear the weight of two lives. If you lie here, what you're doing is you're you're now going to divide your energy. You're going to divide your energy and all your vitality and all your gladness, and it's going to be divided into two pieces. The ideal self you want to project, this image you want to project, and the real you that God wants to forgive and work in. So did you do it? Right? I, I ask him. We, we talk about this all the time. Because I don't want the hooks of the enemy to set deeply in my children. E- even these little dialogues where they, they choose to walk in deceit, they're choosing to do what most of us do, and it's crushing to project one thing about us while, while being another. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, I'm going to put that nonsense on its heels. I'm going to take away. That's why I point to the cross so often. Because Jesus already outed you. This kind of ideal self-nonsense where you don't struggle, where you don't have issues, you're not worried. He's already outed you. You're broken. You need help. Every single one of us in this room is broken. And, and, And Jesus is saying, I have help for you. I'm going to shine light into the darkness. Darkness doesn't overcome light. You've never opened your door at night and darkness just came into your, uh, you know, encompassed your house. No, you open your light, your house, and, and the light shines out. This is what Jesus does. We see it in this verse. By the way, if this is you right now and you have secret, unconfessed sin. Now, I'm not talking about general struggles. We all, we all have those. I'm saying your life is marked by a consistent cycle of being sucked into the same thing over and over again. And you hate it and you're trying to overcome it. And, and you don't want anybody to know about it. And, and so you just, just keep trying with self-determined will to handle it yourself. And, and you've gotten nowhere. And you look back and it's been five years or eight years or ten years or for some of us, twenty years. And you just keep trying and you think you're going to figure this thing out. Look at what happens in John chapter 8 if you have your Bible. Verse 2 is a well-known story. In John chapter 8, verse 2, it says, Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, uh, they said to him, Teacher, This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might know, they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. I mean, don't you want to know what he's writing on the ground? Like, that's one of those questions I have whenever I get up there. 
I, I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. Conjecture is conjecture. So he's riding on the ground, and look what happens. Verse 9. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now, why? Why? Because older men have a portfolio of failures, and younger men think they're experts. If you're in your 20s or younger, you think you're smarter than the rest of us. When you're in your 50s, you know that you've learned some hard lessons, and that should temper you as you get older. That's why it's the older men first who are like, dang it, and they drop the rock. So here's this woman. She's been caught in the act of adultery. Praise God for the wickedness of the Pharisees, or this woman would have been stoned. They wanted Jesus, so they dragged this woman to Jesus. They have clear means by the law to pelt this woman with stones until she dies. They bring her caught in her shame. She didn't confess. You catch that, right? She didn't confess. She's busted. She's outed in her sin. They drag her in front of Jesus. Now, my guess is she's on the ground, kind of covered up, waiting for the first rock to hit her, hoping that it's, that it's a headshot so it knocks her out and she doesn't feel the rest. And she's listening to this dialogue. Now Jesus says, let the one of you who's without sin throw the first stone. And then thud, thud, thud. They all, they all drop the rocks. Jesus walks over to her, picks up her head, looks her in the eyes and says, where are they? Right? Has no one condemned you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. This story reminds me of John 3, 17. For Christ has come into the world, not, con- not to condemn the world, but rather to save the world from condemnation. I I, I want to point out this woman in an overwhelmed sense of guilt and shame. She did not confess her sins. She's caught in the act. Now, use your imagination what that looks like. The scripture is clear that she is caught in the act of adultery. She didn't commit adultery, uh, go home, feel sick to her stomach, and, and call her priest the next morning and say, I feel terrible, I want to make a penance. She she didn't have time for the guilt to set in. That's not what happens. She gets busted in the act. Those who don't even come clean of their own viol, you know, their own th- thought process are extended grace by Jesus. This is a stunning mercy that God gives us in Christ. He is the light of the world. He puts darkness on its heels. If you're walking in secret, unconfessed sin, it ends in one of three ways. With number one, with you taking the off ramp of confession. Now, I'm not promising you it won't be costly. I'm not promising you it won't be painful. I will assure you it will be embarrassing. That's the off-ramp God gives you to spare you from the hooks and death of destruction. The second thing is, or in his mercy, he will out you. This happens all the time. He'll just, you're busted. This is what happened to the woman. I think the third way is the hardest. In God's wrath, he will simply turn you over to your sin to be destroyed by it. Now, this is a frightful thing. You you, you will get that sense that you're getting away with it, that you're hiding it really well, that you're really good um, at getting away with something, when in reality, God, in his wrath, has turned you over to it. That's what Romans 1 teaches. There comes a point where where God just says, you know what, you'd rather have this than what I'm offering you. You'd rather chase this life than what I'm offering you? You, you want to walk in darkness? That, that I'm just going to turn you over to it. If you go read Romans one twenty eight and following, you see what begins to happen when God turns you over to darkness. It, it's a type of moral disintegration where, where you go further and further than you ever thought was possible, than you ever thought was unimaginable. And Jesus is the light of the world. He puts the darkness on its heels. Here's the third thing. He takes what is void and he fills it with life. In John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What Jesus is after for you and for me is abundant life. Now, this is true. I, I think we'll all agree upon that. You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy some of the good graces of co- God's common grace, right? And so here's what I mean. You don't have to be a Christian to, ha- to enjoy a really good meal, you, 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 you can be a God-hating pagan and still enjoy a great steak and a bottle of wine or chicken nuggets, whatever your preference is. You don't have to be a Christian to love a vacation to the beach or to the mountains. 
You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy physical intimacy with another human being. None of those things require you to be a Christian. But, but here's where I would argue that in order to experience the fullness of any of those things, you must be a Christian. You can have a good marriage. You can have a good meal. You can have a good vacation. You can enjoy a certain level of intimacy. But outside of Jesus Christ, because we are formless and not formed to fulfill what we were created to do, to bring glory to God and enjoy Him forever, you will always hit a low ceiling. You'll never hit the threshold and and never really be able to understand and realize the extent of joy available in any of those acts. So for the Christian, rooted in the Word of God, informed in his mind, ministering in his heart, and forming his ministry, shaping his body, a great steak and a great bottle of wine leads to worship of something greater. That, that, that's not even on the table for the unbeliever. It's like, dang, this is a good steak, right? They can understand it. But for the believer, for those that are in tune with who God is, man, how generous is God that he provides this meat? Right? Like, how good is God that He thought of those flavors to go together? If you don't think God is about a real sense uh, of enjoying who He is, why does He give us all these different flavors? Like, think of a fajita, right? You got the tortilla, you got the meat, the guacamole, right? The cheese. Oh, is there anything greater? than a good fajita, right? But for an unbeliever, they can't understand it. They, they, it you know, it's like, yeah, that's a good fajita. But for, for the believer, that should create worship. That should create worship in us. Now, maybe you're an unbeliever and you're like, that's just categorically untrue. No, I, I can't get it. Well, well, I have a lost guy that wants to argue with you. I'm a believer um, so I'll let a lost guy argue with you. Now, this is Tom Brady. This is a, this is a dated interview because, because he's won seven Super Bowl rings now. But here's what he said in a 60 Minutes interview on national television several years ago. Here's his quote. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there is something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is, uh, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't. This can't be what it's all cracked up to be. That's Tom Brady. So let's think about Tom Brady. There's 7 billion people on the earth, maybe more. Of of course, you have 10 quarterbacks in the NFL who are not just like journeymen who just are on a different team every year where they have this lot of turnover. Of that 10, you have five franchises that have said, we're going to build this entire thing around you. Of that five, two or three are in the discussion of the greatest of all times. The quarterback position is hard to grade. Uh, which is why the draft has produced so many flops. It requires not just a le- uh, intellect, but uh, a level of processing that's extremely difficult at times, right? Because everybody thinks they can do it. I know every single man, if you like football, I've w- I have watched a football game, you're like, I could have made that. <laughs> every single one of us has. Like when you're <laughs> so Tom, right? Tom Brady is going to be the, in, in the discussion as as one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback of all time. So, so let's real talk real quick. We're all friends here. He's wealthier than you. He's better looking than you. He is living out in many ways, men in particular, most of their fantasies. They will build a statue of him outside of Gillette Stadium. Little boys right now are watching him play and they're being fueled up for their run. The next great quarterbacks will be talking about watching Tom Brady win seven Super Bowls. None of that is true about you. No one is building a statue of you outside your workplace 10 years after you're gone. Can we just agree with that? You could be a great salesman, bro. They're not doing anything special for you. Not only that, but there's not a 12-year-old right now who's going to win an award 15 years from now and be like, man, I remember when I was 11 and I watched such and such market and marketing and I just knew if I applied myself and I worked hard enough and and went to all those camps, I could market like this marketer marketed, right? That's, That's not you. No one is watching you on a global stage and going, that's incredible, right? That's something to aspire to. 
You're, you're just being faithful where you are. But here's where Tom Brady serves us. He has the American dream at his lap. And here's what he says. He's won seven Super Bowls. They, they did a documentary on the six quarterbacks who were drafted before him just to shame the other teams for not drafting Brady. T. Martin, you ever heard of him? He was drafted before Brady. He's now a high school football coach in Georgia. I mean, they're just shaming T. Martin. Hey, hey all, these other guys are, all these other guys are bums. Tom Brady. You see what you miss here? Tom Brady. Tom has it all. Seven Super Bowl rings. A part of the country that worships him like he's part of the Trinity. A church stadium where 80,000 worshipers gather on a Sunday and chant his name. And this guy says, there's got to be more. God, there's got to be more. Surely this isn't it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has put eternity into the heart of man. Therefore, only what is eternal can fill the gap of eternity. This is why Tom Brady, seven Super Bowls and a Victoria's Secret model wife says, oh my God, this can't be all there is. This can't be it. Because it's not. Giselle and another seven Super Bowls are never going to be able to fill the gap of eternity. They can't. They're temporary. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, I fill that void with life. I fill that void with purpose. Life plays itself out and it ties it all together. We get a new heart. And, 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 and from, there, from, from there, we get that sense that we're walking not in duplicity, but in an open and honest walk. Our relationships deepen and we begin to walk in community because not only have we been formed, but we're walking in the light. Think of how much easier it is to be loved and have deep community if you're fully known, if you have no secrets. If you're hiding, if you're walking, living a secret life and you're hiding, you can't receive people's love because you think that they love the image that you've projected, not the, not the real you, and it actually enslaves you further. Then lastly, you see here that you have purpose. I, I've often argued that life in Christ is the death of boredom. Because if the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever, that brings purpose to my neighborhood. That brings purpose to my workplace, purpose to my son's and daughter's activities. It means I am reflecting the light of Christ anywhere and everywhere I go by enjoying him. And I enjoy him by lining myself up with his good, right commands that are meant to lead me to the fullest life possible. Jesus is the light of the world. Now, I know you're hearing these things as a whole person. You've come in here with a specific mindset, and the mindset has informed your heart a specific way. In the midst of all that, you're hearing this, and because we have different mindsets, that have shaped how we think and feel and interact with information, we're all process, processing this thing differently. So here's my role and my hope. I, I mean not to judge you in any way today. I'm going to lay before you that Jesus is the light of the world in the hopes that by the grace of God, you might make sense. You might make sense of that feeling of being unformed and you might trust upon the name of Jesus. That if you feel stuck in darkness and have tried to get out by continually stubbing your toes on things and you trip over things or, or not quite able to make it into the light, I want you to know that Jesus is the light of the world. I, I've prayed all week that if you feel like you're chasing things, you're never going to be Tom Brady, but you're doing all right and you just hit that low ceiling. I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit of God might awaken your heart this morning. That, that if you're chasing things that you think are going to fill you, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would awaken your heart this morning so that you realize that only He, as being the light of the world, can fill that void that can put darkness on its heels and can give you life. If you're walking in an ongoing secret sin. My prayer is that you might remember the goodness of God, that his grace to you, that, that it might lead you to take the on-ramp of the off-ramp of confession. Don't continuously carry things with you. And I'm just going to say this to you. 
I, I hope and I believe this to be true and I want it to continue that this church is a, play, is a safe place. If you've ever felt like I can't say anything because somebody might judge me, I want you to know, at least for me, that this is a safe place because we're all broken people, right? We're all in need of a savior. Don't carry around unconfessed sin because you think somebody's gonna judge you. I'm not saying they won't, but I'm saying as far as this church is concerned, it's not going to happen here. This is going to be a place of healing and wholeness and community where we can each strive together to be more like Jesus. And so my hope that as we get ready to take communion, that, that you'll examine your life. You'll examine this time. That you'll confess these things to the Lord. That you'll understand that just like David, like when I carry unconfessed sin, it makes me physically ill. Maybe some of y'all are walking in a sickness that you can't seem to overcome because you're carrying unconfessed sin. Confess it today. Walk in the light today. Let him fill you with life today. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your spirit will move powerfully through this room. I pray it speaks. You know what each and every person in this room needs to hear. And so God, I pray that you will speak. And that whatever needs to be done today will be done and you will receive all the glory and all the honor for it. Because we live to serve you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. If the deacons and elders will come forward.